We welcome all of you that have joined us tonight. Those on live stream too. This will be our 71st uh, lesson in Genesis. We're closing in on the on the end of this. We'll be in chapter 44 tonight. Yes, we'll be reviewing the entire chapter. Do you know some of these? Uh, we're providing an overview of these chapters. The, if we went and got bogged down in the details, we'd miss some of the points. So that's that's the reason for this, what we call a review. <clears throat> 44th chapter. Joseph's brothers have returned with Benjamin. <laughs> they still don't know that the ruler of Egypt is Joseph. And we're going to, they're going to make a plea to, to the ruler in this text. Begin by referring to Joseph. He commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in the sacks in his sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money and he did according to the word of that Joseph had spoken as soon as the morning was light the men were sent away they and their asses when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off Joseph said unto his steward up Follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say to them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold the money which we found in our sacks' mouths. We brought it again to thee out of the land of Canaan. And how then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver and gold? Or gold. With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be the Lord's servants, my Lord's servants' bondmen, my Lord's bondmen. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. And then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground, and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the oldest, eldest, and left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And they rent their clothes and laid it, Lord, laid it every man his ass and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house and he was yet there, for he was yet there. They fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Watch ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? For how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are thy, my Lord's servants, both we and he also and with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant, and as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears. Let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. 
My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother's dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. Thou sayest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. When we said unto and we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father should die. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Except our youngest brother, your youngest brother, come down with me, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass that we came up unto thy my servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again, buy us a little food. We said, We cannot go down if our youngest brother be with us. Then will we go down, for we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he's torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy, my servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, even sorrow with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman unto my lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that should come upon my father. <laughs> so you think you have problems, do you? You notice how those brothers didn't fall apart? Or, or did you notice that? That had been the undoing of a good old American Christian. They kept their wits about them. Whatever may not or may or may not be said about them. Those are hard times. They weren't living in the time of kind of the times we're living in. They were living in a time of famine. All the things that went along with it. They didn't have any of the conveniences we've got. Every whatever you did was hard. Now, what we're seeing in this, and I want to say a few introductory remarks about it. We're seeing how God tests people. Yes. And God does test people. He tries yes. people. It could be argued that God knows what's about you already, knows everything about you already. Why does he try it? Well, because there's a lot of other personalities watching, too. And then there's you. Those that see you. So in this entire episode, we're seeing how God always tests people. He tests them sometime. He tests people by a command. Like Adam and Eve, he tested them. You can eat every tree of the garden except... Don't eat of this tree. Amen. Oh, there are still people that when God says don't do something, they don't believe him. Uh -huh. He says murmur not. Wow, you hear this murmuring and griping and complaining all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm? He tests people by commandment. Abraham, he tests by command, offer now your son, your only son, your only son, offer him up to me a burnt sacrifice. That's a test. Amen. All right, you say you're a Christian, you say you love God, 
what would you be willing to do for God? Could you sacrifice your children? Hmm? Then there's Jonah. Tested with the command. Go to Nineveh, that great city. Maybe like saying someone to someone in Joplin, go to New York. I want you to go to New York and announce in 40 days I'm going to destroy it. Well, see, that sounds a little bit different than, than reading the account of Jonah, but that was a, it was a test. It was a test. And sometimes uh, God tests people by temptations. And so Satan's allowed in the garden. He is uh, given the right to take a form that doesn't look suspicious because people weren't afraid of snakes at that time. And he, all he said was, is this really, did God really say don't, did God really say don't eat of this fruit? Of course, the reason he asked that question is he is standing by the tree. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Joseph. He was tested. He was tested. Uh, his brothers hated him, and then it was Potiphar's wife. Yeah. He got all kind of ministers. We had a minister in Senate. We had two ministers here that we know of in Joplin, just down the street here. And a minister in just Seneca. And I, I won't mention anymore because there's just too many to mention. Couldn't stand the test of a woman. Yeah. God sends test. You better believe it. Amen. Better believe it. Amen. God said, let, let some Delilah have access to you. You think you're so strong? Yeah. Amen. There's Achan. Yeah. We're going to destroy the city anyway of Jericho. And he, he saw a Babylonian garment, and everybody needs a good set of clothes, you know. The golden wedge, several pieces of silver. And God had said, don't take anything. Everything's like gold or valuable. Keep that for the tabernacle. Uh -huh. he, he told him, but he, he stole that. It was a temptation, see, but he caved, he caved into it. Right. It wasn't by accident that his eyes fell on those things. That was a test. Yeah. And there was Israel. He tested them out in the wilderness. Sometimes God tests you with a blessing. <laughs> a blessing can be a test. Like for Adam, everything in the garden's yours. It's all yours. With Abraham, I'll bless you, and I'm going to bless you. Or with Israel, blessed him by delivering him from an enemy and giving him bread and giving him water. But the blessing was a test. It was a test. See how they stand. Sometimes God uh, tests people by taking their possessions. He did that with Job. He did that with David. David talked about it too. Psalm 119.9. Sometimes he tests them with wealth. Maybe they win the lottery. Whatever. Israel was tested with wealth. Rich young ruler. He's tested with wealth. He's unwilling to give it all to the poor and follow Jesus. Solomon's prayer, he says, don't give me riches or poverty. Don't let me have the extremes. I'll be rich and think I got it myself. I'll be poor and I'll be tempted to steal. See, so that was a wise, don't give me too much and don't give me too little. There was a test of Paul. He said, I know how to abound. Paul could get a great big offering and he not squander it. Yeah. Amen. Not many people, not many people, not many people like this. 
And he can, uh, he can test people with poverty. Solomon prayed, give me neither poverty. Paul said, I know how to be, I know how to suffer need. I mean, I know how to conduct myself when I don't have anything. Amen. Do you? Or would you fall apart? Or would all of a sudden you think, you'd think like there was no God? Maybe you say, why did God do this to me? He tests. I'm talking about testing now. God tests people. Sometimes he tests them with success. Joseph, he raises them up to the throne. Moses, he elevates him to be leader of the people. Nebuchadnezzar, he gave him all the world. It's a test. It was a test. Sometimes he tests people with failure. Children of Judah couldn't conquer the enemies that occupied the land. They couldn't, couldn't drive them out. Children of Manasseh had the same thing. They couldn't, they couldn't get rid of all of them in the land. And sometimes he tests his people with persecution. Lot, his righteous soul was vexed every day. It doesn't say his righteous soul was vexed at the beginning, but he finally got used to living in Sodom. Uh oh, no, oh, no. Lot never got used to living in Amen. Sodom. Amen. Joseph, he was persecuted by his own brothers. And his enemies said he's treated it really good. Hey, hey. Well, I know no one here has experienced anything like that where, where, you're, where the people or Christians treated you bad, but the world treated you good. I know surely no one's. <laughs> then there's Moses. He endured persecution. His own brethren rejected him. And so I'm showing you this is a divine manner to test people. He tests. Tests. And all heavens are watching when he tests. Insightful people are watching when you're test, tested. I know some, I've been tested, not, as, not nearly as much as these saints here, but I've been tested. But sometimes I think, no, 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 I'm, being, I'm on display now. Whether I, what I got's the real thing or not. Whether I've been pretending or not. Whether I really have faith or not. Heavens are watching, insightful people are watching. Some people expect you to fail. They just expect that to happen. So they're surprised when you don't. But that's a divine manner to test, to try those. Even though he knows them that are his. See? And he knows the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, 10 says. Yet, yet he tests those that are identified with him. He tries them. To the flesh it makes no sense. For God who knows everything, and he knows them that are his, and he knows the, how everything's going to turn out. It doesn't make sense that that kind of God would tell, but he does. Amen. Now with Dan, he does. See, first, he's working with a gallery of heavenly witnesses. God is, has this strong inclination to be known. He wants to be known. Some people don't want to be known. They, in fact, few people, I would say, really want to be known what they, what they really are, what they think about when they're alone, you know, what they do when they're by themselves in a city where nobody knows them. What they, God wants to be known, and he's in a gallery of witnesses who do not know everything about him. So he's using these tests to teach people about himself. He initiates tests to confirm the uprightness of his choices. That when you hear God say, do this, don't do that, these tests and how God reacts confirm to you God knows what he's doing. When he tells you to do something, you better drop all and do it. Amen. He tells you some, to not to do something, you better exercise yourself immediately not to do it. Trials and tests are, are a facet of his instruction. He t <laughs> this is like a, one of the courses in his school. Tests. 
even in the world, tests before you're approved, you got to pass some tests. Even in industry, there's machinery and things like this. They before they're used, they have to pass some tests. See, I think people should be told this. Should be told you want to be used by God, you got to pass some tests before you do. Pass of his instruction. And also, those who are tested and tried, yet they hold to their way. They don't, they prove an encouragement to those that see them. Yeah, yeah you see them, you see it. You see someone, you say, oh boy. You know, some people pass through some tests. You're thankful you didn't go through it. You saw, oh, boy, that, that gives me some courage to see the way brother or sister passed through that test. Uh -huh. you know, I want to see that in, in Joseph here. Let's take a moment and, and, uh, and make an effort to define what a test is. As I said, they take different uh, forms. But they're seeing, a test is seeing whether what the person says he is, that that's really what he is. What a person says he believes, that, that really is what he believes. See, in a, in a society where things kind of are pretty smooth, but most people have what they need, plus a little more, and you can pretty much chart your course and make as much money as you'd like to make. And see, that, that life of ease is conducive to spiritual slumber. The tests break through all of that because you in Christ you're considered gold gold and precious stones and silver that's what you're like but that is because you claim to be among those people that doesn't mean you are and we don't know enough about one another to really discover discover that but God knows how to bring it out. Amen. Now, I don't, I don't want to dwell on this, but we have seen some people fall away. Why did they fall away? They didn't pass some test. That's what happened. God knew all along. God, God knew all along. We didn't know. They didn't know. But God paraded a test before them Amen. that brought out something inside that not even they knew was there. Huh? That's what a trial is. That's what trials are for. I don't want to test your strength. I understand that. I understand your strength is tested. But over and above all of that, who you really are. If you have a difficult experience and you manage to weather it, you come out of the thing, you got something. Amen. That's why you came out. Amen. You got something. Something from God that'll keep your soul. See, it'll testify. It'll testify to you. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were tested during a time of lesser revelation. See, they... It was a period of time they didn't have a lot of information about how you should live. I mean, you got a lot of information about how you should live. They didn't. They didn't have a lot of information about how they should live. In their case, he was, it wasn't their profession that was being tried. See, their profession wasn't what was being tried. What was being their faith was being tried, so they know the value of faith. See, how do, how do you know the value of faith? Not academically. You can't do it by the definitions of faith. You know it by the, what, it, what it passes through, safely, what it endures. That tells you. So the test of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was testing their faith. 
for their sake to prove you can try you can trust God. Amen. See, see, you trusted God and God brought you through that. Amen. There was testing like Job, yeah. and his testing wasn't really for him. It was for us. Right. <laughs> There's people like that, people in scriptural history that were tested for our sake. You have heard of the patience of Job. Has anyone in heaven heard about yours? It's a good day. I think some of the brethren here have been heard about for their patience. For generations to come, there's people that are... And Job was tested to prove to the devil the devil was wrong about Job. Because the devil said, the only reason Job's serving you is because you won't let me get at him. And so God tested Job to prove to Satan, you're, you're wrong about Job. Then, as I mentioned, there's generations to come that learn. Now, now the saints today, concerning the saints today, their trial is an is a ultimate means to their perfection. God's making something out of you. And what he's making out of you, brothers and sisters, isn't something for this world. Is something for the world to come. Amen. And if you ever forget that, you will start going back. Uh -huh. You will start losing ground. Yep. Here's how Peter put it, 1 Peter 5.10. The God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after, I say after, you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. See, if you want to be established, strengthened, and settled, you got to pass through. Amen. You got to pass through testing. Don't you dare complain about it when you do. Amen. If, if, you, if you just can't help but complain about it, don't complain to me about it. Don't complain to any of the brethren about it. Amen. Find some old worldly person and gripe about it to them. Why is that? Because you'll feel guilty if you do. So that's, that's something about trial. What was we reading about trials? You might call that the theology of trial. Now Joseph gives a commandment to his steward. He says, fill the men's sacks. Uh, not, not give them each a little, put a little grain in everybody's sack. About, about half full. Fill every man's sack. Fill it up. Fill it up. Now, his instructions are very specific to the steward. The steward's got to do is to fill all the sacks, fill them with as much grain as possible, put every man's money in the mouth of the sack, and put my silver cup in the young per in the youngest brother's sack, Benjamin. See, it's, that's the instructions. He didn't hold a class on this. He just told him these four instructions, and the steward had to do it. Sometimes God doesn't use the repeat method. You know, there's a saying in the, in the world, repetition is the mother of all learning. That's a stupid saying. That's like saying if a person drowned, and you got to say, you got to throw him a lifesaver and say five times to him, grab the lifesaver, grab the lifesaver. <laughs> See, that's, it's not a true saying. Repetition is the mother of all learning. Repetition means the person you're talking to is dense. I don't want to get on that, but that... I've heard that all my life. And it hasn't worked out that way. At all. Little Johnny didn't see out of the street after you said it 20 times. That's right. Just some things, if you don't obey it now, like when, when God said to Israel, go forward. What is it? Uh, if you don't, the Egyptians are going to kill you. See, there's things like that. The divine trait is seen here. He told, Stuart, Joseph told the steward exactly what to do and how to do it. He told him exactly what to do and how to do it. All right, now let's, I'll give you some examples of how God, this is God's manner. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. You know, it takes it with all thy strength. She told you what to do, how to do it. Now, it wouldn't have been right, now, it wouldn't have been right for that steward to fill those sacks half full. And it's not right to love God with half your heart. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Take ye from among you an offering to the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. Whosoever is, whosoever is he bring an offering to the Lord, how do you do it? With a willing heart. The willing heart. Don't be asking, what can I afford? Amen. Well, people, they did. Now listen, people think like this when they give them to the Lord. What can I afford? What can you afford? We're talking about God here. Yes, who has everything. You can give him 10% and he can give you 150%. That's the way God is. Amen. Here's another. But God be thanked that you were the servants of God. You are the servants of sin. You were the servants of sin, but you've obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine, which was baptism. You obeyed it. He told you what to do and how to do it. From the heart. Not because we baptized so many on Easter. I mean, it wasn't. It's from the heart. Now, the end of the commandment is 1 Timothy 1 5. This is showing you what to do and how to do it. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Charity, that's love. How do you love the brethren? With a pure heart with a good conscience, with faith unfeigned. <laughs> you know what to do and how to do it. Here's something else, 1 Timothy 2 to 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So when you pray, you've got these uh, requests or whatever. How holy are you? By God's definition, how holy are you? You don't have to tell me, but God, this is God requires holy hands. Amen. You can't be in wrath. Wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Amen. And you can't have doubting. That's it. He tells you what to do, pray, how to do it. Here's what he tells you to draw near and tells you how to do it. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure waters. That's how, that's how you come to God. This is how you come to him. If you come to God any other way, like you can't really expect a favorable answer. See why, see why a person has to pay attention to how they live? That's why you have to pay attention to this. This affects your relationship with God. It affects everything you do because God demands, if you do something with me, you have to have your head on and your heart tender. Amen. That's God's manner. Fill the men's sacks with food. See, now that's the mode of the kingdom. Fill that's the mode of the kingdom. Fill, fill the men's sacks with food. The orders are give them as much as they can carry. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and everybody's either, all of a sudden, you're talking about having a benefit or having goal, they, their strength kind of increases. They got more strength, you know, they can. As much as they can carry, that's a kingdom standard. It's assumed, of course, that their sacks were empty. If the sacks were half full of rocks and dirt, well, then that's yeah. has something else in it. Kingdom standard, yeah. full of joy, Amen. full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, full of good works, full of goodness, filled with knowledge, full assurance of understanding, full assurance of hope, full mercy, full of mercy, yes. joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving a full reward, the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ, filled with the fullness of God, being fully persuaded. See, that's, a, that's the manner of the kingdom. This, this blight of part-time Christianity, 
God has nothing to do with this. He's not looking for people that are a little religious. These kind of people aren't getting in where he's at. I know it's not popular to say so, but we're going to say it anyway. See, one of the blights of modern Christendom is they're satisfied with small portions from God. Some people are right. They can take a 20 minutes, maybe. Maybe. I'm talking, if it's a substance. A lot of the 20 minute things aren't even substance. It's just 20 minutes worth of pablum at the, at the best. But their hearts are filled with other things. There's other things they're thinking about. Some people sit in the assembly and they're thinking about something else. It was fashionable where, where I was raised up. There'd be people thinking about what was cooking for dinner. They'd put something in the oven so it'd be ready when they get home. We'd, we don't do that here because it'd burn up probably. But the people would sit there and think of other things on their minds. We can't control that. But don't expect to be filled with something from God if this is so. You're not going to get your sack filled if there's a bunch of other stuff in it. That's why we, we want to have as li little distraction as possible. That's right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the result of this is that the people of God are not able to receive what God has promised to give. They've just got other things. It's not that the other things are like unlawful. It's like the Bible says you shouldn't do that. It's not, it's not that kind of thing. It's just that it's something that competes with the knowledge of God. It's things that if there wasn't a God at all, it wouldn't change this. You'd still think about this thing anyway. So this is God's manner. And you learn from it that whatever God is permeates everything he does. If God tells people to do something, it always is connected with who he is and how he is, his traits. So fill them in, sex. Don't you want your sack filled, so to speak? Yeah. Then get it ready. Yes. <laughs> we assume when they came, when they brought their sacks to Egypt, they brought them empty in. And put every man's money in his sack's mouth. There it is, the second time he's done this now. Put it on top where it'll be, where it'll be seen right, a bit, right off the bat. Otherwise, uh, don't, let it, don't put it where it can get down in the grain. You won't see it. I want them to, when they open their sack, I want them to see right away. I want, right away, I want them to see how gracious I am. Right away, I want them to see that I'm, I'm a giver here. Yes, amen. Even though it looks like I was selling the grain, in your case, I was given it. See? <laughs> Ooh, you got to be able to make the transition here, but this is the way salvation is, see? You did. You had to do this, and you had to do that, and it is true, you did. You had to do this, and you had to do that. And you had to repent, and you had to confess, you had to be baptized, you had to do all this. When you opened up the sack, <laughs> you found out salvation was really a gift. All the way. That's the glorious type, isn't it? Jesus said to a backsliding church, he says, come and buy from me gold refined in the fire and so forth. If they did do this, their money would have been in the mouth of their sack, so to speak. They'd find out in the end that even though they had to give up this and give up that to get what God has, in the end, it was a gift. Amen. The purchase, in our case, was actually made by Christ. He actually made the purchase. You were bought with a price. Now he says, uh, Steward, you know that silver cup I got? My silver cup? My silver one. I don't, don't take the clay one. I'm, the silver one. And put that silver cup in the mouth, sack's mouth of the youngest person. That's Benjamin. Put it on top. As soon as they open that sack, poof, that silver cup. 
they'll see that silver cup. It was Joseph's personal cup. I say it was his personal cup. Something like God's personal righteousness. So when you open your sack up, you find, I got something here that really belongs to God. I got something here that really belongs to Christ. He put it in your sacks. It's a, it's a type. Now, from Joseph's viewpoint, this is another test to see the integrity of the brothers. Are they just going to say, oh, look at here. Got this silver cup. Let's, let's get home. We can set this on the mantle. Say, we got this down in Egypt. It was a test. See, it was a test. But it was a picture of salvation at the same time. That when you find out it's salvation, it's almost like you think maybe this is a mistake. Maybe I'm looking at this wrong. It seems, so you want to look into it a little bit further because it seems almost like too good to be true. But it was, it was true. And the steward did according to Joseph's word. See another type there of a good and faithful steward. Joseph told him what to do and he did it. Faithfulness involves not only doing what the Lord has said, but how the Lord said to do it. Involves that. And it's written, it is required in stewards. It's required. It's required. By God, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's a requirement. I say that's a requirement. So let's say that a person, God, has given somebody the stewardship of speaking or the stewardship of singing or the... Now, it's required that you do that for the Lord. That's not something you give to the world. God doesn't make you a steward to take what he gives you and give it to the world. I won't say any more about that, but there's a lot there to be, a lot there to be seen. So the man did this, and when the morning came, they sent the men away. So they'd have a lot of light to travel by. You, if you can see it in your progress in the matter of being conformed to the image of Christ. You do not move to the next stage of glory till you pass through this stage of glory. See? So they, they're not going to get home till they pass through these various tests. Eventually, these brothers are going to end up back in Canaan. But they're going to have to go through. They can't take some shortcuts. They're going to have to go through these tests to get their progress is in the kingdom must be perceived by you. You've got to see it. Now, it's depicted in a word that Peter gave in 1 Peter 5. I give a little stair-step thing there. You, you begin with faith, and then you add. You don't add to faith charity. <laughs> it, <laughs> you got to do this like God said to do it. Virtue means you're trustworthy could depend on you. Knowledge, that means knowing God, knowing the things of God. Temperance, that means you control yourself. Patience, that means you endure. Godliness, that means you have a holy character. Brotherly kindness, see there's a certain kind of love that's given to God's people, it's not given to anybody else. And charity in all things. See, you, you've got to progress just like these brothers had to progress in their journey back home. A kingdom manner. When we are carrying out the will of the Lord, doing the will of God from the heart, as Ephesians 6, 6 says, we must not question that will. If Naaman is told to dip in the River Jordan seven times, that's what has to be done. 
<laughs> if Moses sees that the only water available to the Israelites is bitter, and the Lord shows him a tree, tells him to toss the tree in the water, and it may be made drinkable. That's what Moses has to do. Amen. If Jesus and his disciples are going to feed 5,000 men and there's no, not enough bread available, and Jesus says, make the men sit down, that's what you have to do. Good stewards do not ask, why? God told them to do something. Like, why hast thou made me thus? Yeah. Now, Joseph tells the steward to say about this cup. It's the cup by which he divined or practiced divination. Now, I am chagrined, to say the least, at the manner in which most commentators handle this verse. They launched, first of all, into a lengthy explanation of how a divining was taking place in Egypt and did to buy cups, and they give you the history of all that. And some of them alleged that Joseph was doing this. He was divining. But this is just a lot of theological nonsense, period. Joseph is testing the brothers. Joseph no more used a cup of divination than they stole his cup. It's a test. As someone says, why does, you should always tell the truth. All the truth. You should never try and hide anything. Well, that's, that's generally true, but that's not altogether right. That's not altogether right. We have a text here as an example. Well, let me give you some more. Rahab, the harlot, Hid the Jewish spies, you remember, hid them in her house. King heard about it, sent a message to her, and when she knew that, she went up and hid them in the, up among some sheaves up on a roof. She hid the men so they couldn't be seen. King sent a message to her, bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they are come to search out the country. <clears throat> Rahab said, well, there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. That's not what they, she told them. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. All right. What are you going to do about that? Are you able to receive that? Because she's in the Messianic lineage, you know. Her and all her household was saved. Right. Well, what do you... See, you have to do something with these texts. You can't just pretend they're not in the Bible. Right. Here's another one, Samuel. Samuel went to Jesse's house to anoint young David king. God told him, how, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Because Samuel had anointed Saul, and he was a very tender young man when he did and Saul was really upset that Saul ended up with not having the kingdom. How long will thou mourn over Saul seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go and I'll send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said how can I go? If Saul hear it he'll kill me. And the Lord said Take a heifer with thee, and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I shall name unto thee. Well, see, that really is not why he went. That's God that said that. That's God told him to say that. Now, I do understand that you want to be careful about taking some matters into your own hands and... But I'm just showing you how God works. David, let's take another example. These are things said that, strictly speaking, weren't true. Here's David. David was running from King Saul, and he came upon the priest Ahimelech. And Ahimelech said, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? 
that normally he had his army with him. And David replied, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. But he was <laughs> he's running from King Saul. That's what he what he said. I'm on a private mission. I can't tell anybody what it's all about. Here's David again. David was in the but in the Philist among the Philistines, and he pretended he was mad, out of his mind. Here's how it reads: And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish, king of Gath, and he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hands, and scrabbled or spit on the doors of the gate, and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, you see this: the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? Have I need of madmen that ye should have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? <laughs> Someone said, well, that was hypocritical. Well, be careful while you talk. You better know what you're talking about. Here's Elisha. So I'm showing you now things that were said that strictly speaking weren't true, but they were said you can't, like, invent stuff like this. I'm just showing you what things God has used. An army came down to arrest Elisha. He prayed to God. God struck him blind. Elisha said to the blinded army, who were told, they, they were told he was in Dothan, and that's where they were at, in Dothan. And Elisha comes to these blinded men in Dothan that were sent there to get him, and he said, this is not the way. Neither is this the city. Follow me, and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. <laughs> but he led them to Samaria, which is the capital of Israel. <laughs> Why did he do that? Well, I, I can't give you answers to all that. I'm just telling you what God did. And I'm telling you, sometimes there's things that arise that that'll, these texts will mean something to you. The children of God must be knowledgeable of these records. Now, be overly simplistic about them. We're not advocating that at all. We're just saying spiritual life is not as simple as some people have made it. And working out your salvation with fear and trembling is not as simplistic. you got to have faith in, to do this. You do need divine direction. Amen. This happened to be things that we were directed. Yes, yes Brother Bob. Part of that is not casting your pearls before the swine yeah. and being wise wise in your generation yeah. because he's keeping Satan under chains of darkness. Satan yeah. is not privy to everything God's doing. That's right. And it, we should not be naive enough to think that he should be. Now let's, let's say, for instance, you're witnessing to someone about the Lord and they're, they have nothing to do with the Lord. And you say, now the Lord has promised to keep you. And everything will work out for your good. All things work out together for good. And the best is yet ahead. This is not stuff you tell them. Now you'll have to take it from there. <laughs> well, our text says he overtook him or caught up with him. And he told him what Joseph said to tell him. What have you done? Is this... What have you done? You've taken my cup. They said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? <laughs> what are you saying this to us for? God forbid that the thy servant should do according to this thing. Behold the money which we found in our sacks mouths we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of my, thy Lord's house silver and gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, let him die and we also will be my Lord's bondsmen. He said, now let it also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. See, they were sure there was nothing in their sex. They were sure. They were not the last first people that were sure nothing could be found in them that wasn't, shouldn't be there. Oh, they were, 
they weren't the only people that taught this. I tell you, when God sends somebody to examine, he's apt to find things you didn't know were there. They didn't know this was there. It's kind of ironic. Since it happened to them last time, you would think that why didn't they check before yeah, they I left? Know. I mean, you would think that that would, but I think God kept that from them, and, and they just went on. That's right. There's a test. See, there's a test to give. See, it's, see they've, they've learned a little bit, all right. Now we're going to give, graduate them, give them some more tests. You don't expect these tests. That's right. That's right. That's right. Amen. Think, now look, let's think this thing out reasonably, steward. The last time we were here, we found money in our sacks, and we kept it at home. We didn't spend any of it. We brought it back here to you. What? Why then would we steal a cup? Yeah, that's right. See, let's reason about this. Yeah. But see, <laughs> there were some things the brothers didn't know. Uh -huh. They didn't know that Joseph had put this in there. It's what they speak hastily. Oh, all right, whoever has this cup, let him die. We know nothing's here. Let him die. Lord, if I find anything in me, let me die. I've been wholehearted with you. I've lived wholehearted to you. I haven't tried to do things for my own self. You can search me out and see, Lord. You might not think some people think this way, but there's some people think this way. David was very cautious. He said, search me. Look in my sack. See if you find anything there that shouldn't be there. Right? You've got to be this open with the Lord. Say, look in. Search me out, Lord. Tell, and tell me what you find. Yeah. And you'll find out. They'll say, oh, here's, some, here's something here. This shouldn't be here. Yeah. You'll say, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I hadn't seen it from this, this angle. Yeah, that's right. I haven't been trusting you. Like, I've tried to exploit your grace. I treated your grace like it was a stolen cup. Mm. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Well, he spoke hastily, as I said. He was, they shouldn't have said that, but that's what people have no confidence in God where they talk hastily. They don't, they don't give thought to what they say. The steward responds, no. I'm not going to consent to this. Only the one with his had had the cup. He's the only one that's going to be the servant. That I'm not going to consent to to what you said. <clears throat> See, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Proverbs 16:1 says. So all of this told you a lot about the brothers. They thought on the surface. See? Did you see that? They thought on the surface. You'd have thought they would have taken the sacks down and they would have examined them and said, well, let's make sure that it's not here. They didn't. They spoke hastily. They were too shallow. <coughs> and this is one of the uh, penalties of shallow thinking. And if you have a religion that promotes shallow thinking, it has made people vulnerable. It has put people within the reach of Satan. It, is, it has encouraged them to live superficially. Yes. How are you examine yourself? That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, they speedily took down every man in sack. He opened up the mouth for the third to look, and you'd have thought they'd have looked, but they, did, they themselves didn't. They were so confident, they just opened the sack and said, go ahead and look. Confident the ruler's cup wouldn't be found. After the experiences they'd had, <laughs> you would have thought they'd, they would have thought that we better look at, we better look in the, what's in the, they didn't see the money, the money either. See, they missed the money too. So they miss what God gave, and they miss what shouldn't be there. They just they didn't look. Uh -huh. yeah. right. So you can bury your heart, but if you don't look, uh -huh. the level of a person's confidence will determine what he does. Yeah. Of course, has a false confidence, he'll actually set himself up. 
for a fall. Now, in the matter of life, why do some professing Christians, why do they live in a sloppy manner? They don't have, they don't live as carefully as they, as they brush their teeth and comb their hair in the morning. They're not careful about how they live before the Lord. Why? Why is that? It's because like Joseph's brothers, they're confident of their status. They think they're more safe than they really are. Some people would never, would never think of going to work like they look when they got out of bed. They would never do this. But they come to God like in the rough. <laughs> and don't prepare themselves. Now they, he searched from the oldest to the youngest. He searched. See, their growing confidence was unfounded, which is another trait of the flesh. And much to their surprise, the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Now, their confidence was undisturbed until <laughs> this happened. Maybe you've had experience like this. You felt like you were going along pretty good, yeah. trusting in the Lord, good progress being made, and suddenly, whoop, a silver cup is found in your life. Something that shouldn't be there. You've treated something that belonged to God as though it was yours. Huh? Yeah, it was disturbed by this, uh, kind of jarred him out of this complacency. And it says they tore their clothing. Now, people in the East, they are more serious about their religion than people in the West. People in the West, they'd never tear their clothes. Not their clothes. Be the more vain bit more vain, but they did, and there's a lot about tearing the clothes in the, in the scriptures. Jacob tore his clothes, David tore his clothes, Ahab tore his clothes, Elisha tore his clothes, Hezekiah tore his clothes, Isaiah tore his clothes, Athaliah tore her clothes, Ezra, Eliakim, Shebna, Joah, Josiah, Mordecai, Adi, Manashekim, Caiaphas, Barnabas, and Paul. They tore their clothes. And under the law, lepers were required to tear their clothes. How about that? And priests were forbidden to tear their clothes. Tear their clothes. Rending of the garments is an outward expression of an inner of an inner grief or sorrow or fear or disappointment. It's bringing the outward person to reflect the status of the inward person. In this case, a regret, remorse, sorrow, tearing the clothes. caused by a circumstance that a person can't do anything about. See? So it's like an act of exasperation. Realize that, oh, this is, this is something I can't. <laughs> my strength has run out. There's nothing I can do about this. I, my clothes are useless at this point. And I, have you ever been brought to that point where you suddenly realized, I can't do anything about this. If God doesn't answer my prayer, I'm I, I'm not going to have, be improved. Yeah, right. That's what this that tearing the clothes is expressing that outwardly. And uh, this isn't something that thoroughly satisfied God. Understand? Here's something Joel said about this. He said to the people, "Rend your heart, not your garments." Amen. How about that? Huh? How about that? <laughs> Tear your heart, not your garments, and turn to the Lord, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. So, 
allow yourself to be broken up. <coughs> broken on the contrite heart, he'll not despise. So if there's something that should make you despair, let it do its work. Amen. And then present yourself to God. There's grace with him. He'll heal your heart. If Judah and his brethren come to Joseph's house, he'd remain there to confront him. And he asked him, what have you done? All right, this is a picture of the day of judgment. Men are going to give an account. It isn't that God's going to say, Here's what I found in you. This, this, this. You're going to see. You're going to see all of it. You're going to give an account. Not going to have the flesh anymore. Not going to be in the world anymore. Give an account. Now it's appointed a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. God's appointed this. When all men are going to appear before God, like these brothers appeared before Joseph. They're going to be an account. They're going to give an account. And the people that have sinned, he's going, to, he's going to ask, why did you do that? And no one's going to say, well, we didn't mean to do it. Now, this will, keep you, this will keep you, help keep you pure if you keep this in mind. Even down to your idle word. You, you blurted this out. On uh, November 30th, you blurted this out. Why did you say that? Being as I'm God and all that I've done for you, why did you, why did you say that? Why did that expletive come out of your mouth? You could, this is going to happen, brother. This is, the, this is going to happen, the day of judgment. Here's what the scripture says. He's, he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, that's Jesus Christ. Paul reminded the body of Christ, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, you don't want to have trouble with that statement. So what, whatever's, whatever you've done in the body it's not acceptable there. You get to confessing it and abandoning it now Amen. so that God won't remember it yes. then. <laughs> he was still there. They came to Joseph's house. Joseph didn't come to them out there. and uh, He didn't say, to the steward, as soon as you find him, I'll follow you. As soon as you find him, I'll, I'll confront him out there. No, they're going to have to go to his house. To be confronted, that too is like the day of judgment. We're going to go to his house for the judgment. He will not be, he's not going to remain with us here. He's going to bring us there. When they saw him for the fourth time, they fell down before him. This is now the fourth time they've done this. Remember, Joseph had those two dreams 22 years before this. 22 years before this, he had these two dreams, made his brothers angry. They envied him because he had them. But in all of them, both of them, they bowed down before him. And here, now this is the fourth time they bowed down before him. Not knowing he was their brother. Now you've got to really see this. Jesus is our brother, our elder brother. But that doesn't make him common. We still got to bow down. He's not our buddy. We got to bow down. See, we're his brother. We're called his brethren. That's what we're called. He's the firstborn of our many brethren. But that doesn't mean we're, we're pals. Got to bow down just like they did. It is written, We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, 
Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. I know that these days this is not preached very much. Thankfully, there's an occasional reference to it, but not much. There's some people that think that helping the poor is more important than this. And I'm not sure not against helping the poor. But this has got to be addressed. Amen. Every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. Now, if, they, if you did that here, you'll do it with joy there. Amen. If you didn't do it here, you'll do it with expectation of damnation there. That is how it works. Leaders within the body of Christ must not allow the coming of the Lord in the day of judgment to fade from the memory of the people. But in the last two, three generations, it's began to fade. People don't know. I used to ask churches where I preached in behalf of the school. I'd ask when the last sermon they heard on the second coming, when it was. I never one, I preached at 160 different churches. Not one church said that they'd heard one recently. The only people that did were some old timers that a long time ago. Said a long time ago. They pe men, preachers used to preach about this a long. But nobody said they had heard in recent memory a dissertation on the coming of the Lord. A, a, a focused presentation of the coming of the Lord. See, this is not being done. And some people that do talk about it, talk about it from the standpoint of the Antichrist, and they're not, they're not, this is not being told to the people. So gradually it's fading from view, and people commence to live without this in their mind. You can't do that. When you're at home, you got to remember this. When you're on a job, you got to remember this. When you're in the fellowship, you got to remember this. You got to remember this when you do business. When you're in the Walmart, you got to remember this. So you don't try and pilfer something, you know. You got to remember this. What deed is this? Now, it's important again to remember this was a test. <laughs> what are you, you going to say? Men must learn ultimately to, to trace what's happened to them back to God. They've got to learn to got to learn to do this. This is, again, this is not common. If it's something that's grievous, you've got to be able to trace it back to God. I'm going to give you some examples of this. See, God is the arbiter of humanity. He's the one that's analyzing it, so to speak. Job associated his trials with God. The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, he, shall I receive good from the Lord and not evil? He connected his trial with God. Hosea spoke of the Lord in this way. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn. I say, he hath torn. He will heal. He has smitten. He will bind us up. See, this is this is good sound theology here. God said to Israel, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, and I heal, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Amen. Now, the point I'm making is everything's got to be traced back to God. Amen. Hannah saw this, she prayed. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. you got to believe that, that she had insight. She was inspired. The Holy Spirit summed up this whole matter. Now, this is how Christians are to think. The, the mega church preachers and the media preachers are teaching people that bad experiences come from the devil. 
This is what's being taught to the people. God didn't do that. God didn't do that. Devil did that. But the devil works for God. Yes, amen. Is in strict submission to God. Yes. Here's how Hebrews puts it. The word of the Lord, word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sun, your soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner in thoughts of the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is man, not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So far as we're concerned, there's nobody but God. That's how you have to think now. And if you live to please him, you don't have to worry about anybody else. Amen. Now, that appears on the surface as though there's more of an awareness of this during this spiritually primitive time that we're reading about here, before the law, that they were more aware of this that I've just been talking about than people in the 20th century. Now, that is a serious, serious circumstance. Because of this, men are slow to recognize the chastening of the Lord. See, they don't, if anything bad, say the devil did that. So they, it may be the Lord chasing them, but they have been taught so they can't, they can't think this way. So God may be dealing with them, but they think the level's working against them. See. Now, uh, I've already dealt extensively in the previous lesson about Joseph not being a diviner. He said, I certainly can divine. Didn't you know I can I can certainly divine? I can don't you know that I know what's happening? They wouldn't understand if he said, God give me to see this. So he I can do this cup, he tested him. Now prior to this there'd only been one reference in all the Bible to divining. And it was in Genesis 44, 5 about this incident. There's no mention of divining. Uh, divining, as I understand, did exist, but there's no mention of it in Scripture up to this point. This was apparently a cultic art that was practiced among the heathen. And it's in the category of sorcery by definition of the law. Later in the prophets, reference is made to this practice in Egypt. Isaiah talked about it, this practice in Egypt. And it was condemned 500 years later under the law. It was a condemned, but that wasn't so at this time. So when they heard this, they wouldn't think like we think when we hear it. See? <laughs> they had no reason. Yeah, divining's wrong. They, this hadn't been said. God hadn't revealed this yet. You see it. He told the people later, but it hadn't been told at this point. So I said, this is how why he's tested it. See, he wouldn't have said this after Moses as a test. Now, this is characteristic of evil. It tends to grow in the seedbed of spiritual ignorance. Where the, where the things of God aren't known, evil like sprouts. That's like soil that evil grows there. Like sometimes you have you prepare a special place for a garden. Sister June prepared a special place for garden with special soil and bound it in certain so that certain things would grow in that soil. Ignorance is soil. Now the word of God doesn't grow in it, as the seed on the wayside shows you. But there's other stuff that does. Where you see iniquity increasing. And abounding yeah. spiritual ignorance exists. Yeah. That's why that's happening. <laughs> As I said before, I do not believe Joseph practiced deviation, deviation himself. Why would a man who God revealed yeah. Yeah. things to, why would he ask of a cup? See, yeah. right. Now Judah responds, some convictions now registering. What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? How shall we clear ourselves? God, remember I said you got to trace everything back to God. God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. 
Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with, with whom the cup is found. Apparently, they thought Benjamin took it. But I think he meant a bit more when he said he discovered the iniquity. I believe he was thinking back what they did to Joseph, because they'd reasoned about this, you know. From the very beginning of this confrontation with Joseph, they'd been talking about, well, we shouldn't have done what we did to Joseph, should we? That's 22 years prior. And God waited this long to bring this right down, bearing on their heart. They couldn't, uh, what, we can't, we're not going to offer an explanation. You found the cup. God, God discovered our iniquity. God found us out. See, the scripture said, be sure your sins will find you out. Yeah. Well, say, say, God, God sometimes he discovers your sin by making them known to somebody else. Uh -huh. <laughs> Whew, I don't, I, I prefer not to have this. This methodology. <laughs> That's why it's wise to pray to God, search my heart, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me. That's why it's safe to do that, not, not let somebody from the world have to inform you of your malconduct. Amen. God's found us out. <coughs> we are my Lord's servants. You found out our sin. <coughs> We acknowledge it. What do you want us to do? We're your servants. Is this not what we said? When we were convinced of our sin? Is this not what we said? What wilt thou have me to do? That's mirrored right here. Mirror of salvation. Men are convicted of the guilt of sin and brought to the stark realization that they cannot defend or justify themselves. And only then, only then, will they consent to serve God. So when people aren't serving the Lord, now you know why. They've not come to grips with their sin. They've not. But no matter what they say, they haven't, because the conviction of sin produces this willingness to serve God. Amen. No, he said, God forbid, I'm not going to punish everybody for one man's sin, yeah. uh -huh. even though God did. <laughs> he punished the whole world for Adam's sin. Yeah. How will Joseph react to Judah's proposal? Now, I'm not going to do this. God forbid. Now, there's a lot of talk about what God forbid means. A lot of the versions say, read differently. One says, uh, far be it from me that I should do so. That's the New King James Version. I'd never do such a thing. Heaven forbid that I should act in such a way, Jerusalem Bible. I swear I'll not do this, Holman Bible, Living Bible. Let it not be to me to do such a thing. I would never punish you, all of you, contemporary English version. I will not make you all slaves, English Revised Version. Oh, no, I would never do that, Good News Bible. The Jubilee Bible says, no, why should I do so? See, there, the versions that say, God forbid... Include the King James, the Douay Reims, the Easy Read Bible, Geneva Bible, Revised Version, Amplified Bible. They all say God forbid. The Hebrew word translated God forbid has this meaning, lexical meaning. Far be it from me, God forbid that, or let it not be. That's So some of the Greek Mythology used it, let it not be. Several commentators say it, be, God forbid, they use, you use that pulpit commentary, John Gill, John Calvin, others, they use the word God forbid. Now, I prefer that translation, why? And I'll tell you why. A person who's lived with the consciousness of God, 
will say, God forbid, before he says, I would never do that. See, saying, I would never do that, that that's an inordinate trust in self. I, I prefer God forbid. I appeal to God to, to us. I prefer that. I won't make an issue of it, but that's just my own preference. He said, the man who had the cup, he'll be my, he'll be my servant. That's not what they said. They said, let him die. Whoever had the cup, let him die. That's, remember, that's what they said. He said, no, he'll be my servant. The point is, they'll not be punished for the theft of Joseph's cup. Only the one, not, they'll not be beaten, they'll not be imprisoned. Go in peace. Go safely home. You're not going to have to pay a penalty for this. Uh, Judah, he says, oh, thank God we got free from that. Let's go, boys. He, he's thinking about his dad, about Jacob. Judah comes there to him, says, I got something to say to you privately. One version says, I, got, I want to say it openly, but uh, privately, I want, I want to say something in your ears. Don't let thy anger burn against thy servant. Now, because I'm, I want to tell you something, but don't be angry with me because I'm saying this. Judah knows that in the context of Joseph's position and his duties, he's about to mention something that could be viewed as rather trivial in view of supplying grain for the whole world and this that he's going to ask kind of a small thing don't be angry with me because I bring up something personal and something small like this thou art even as Pharaoh I mean he said I know I know it's like I'm just talking straight to Pharaoh and uh, this is something I consider very very important even though I understand that to you this sounds kind of trivial now you have this is the way holy men have spoken to God there's examples of this there's something about holy men that they kind of sense God doesn't deal with trivia it's kind of it's kind of in the consciousness of men they're very conscious of it yet they they also there are times when you got to bring these things up I remember when Abraham pled with God he's pleading for Lot but he asked if he'd destroy the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma, Zobim, those cities. Listen how he reasoned. He said, peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city, would thou also destroy and not spare the place for them, the 50 righteous? That be far from thee to do after this manner, so to slay the righteous with the wicked, and the righteous should not be as the wicked as might, might that be far from thee? Shall not the judge of the earth do right? Didn't now listen how, he, listen how he talks. Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak to the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. There, there you are. <laughs> Again, and he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I, and I will speak. Or again, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. See? There's this holy hesitation when he spoke before God. They, they, they knew what I'm talking about is very, very important to me, but it probably isn't that important to God. Uh -huh, yeah. Ezra said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up into heaven. I pray like this quite a bit. So I'm ashamed for the state of the American church. I blush to lift up my face to thee. Gideon said, let not thine anger be hot against me. I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with thy fleece. He, he wanted to be sure it was God talking. Let me throw out this fleece. He knew that, well, that's kind of when you're dealing with God, that's kind of trivial to say the least we don't let your anger yeah. David said oh Lord rebuke me not in thy wrath yeah. neither chasten me in the hot displeasure yeah. see the saints of old they were acutely aware that earthly trivia is out of order before God yeah. uh -huh. that it may be very 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 critical to you but it's not very 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 critical to God 
Now, some people, they don't teach this. They say, God's concerned about what you're concerned about. Well, that be now that would be a very, very difficult thing to prove. And I don't know that this is how you want to approach God. I take this other. Then you have the, co the contrast. You have people that will say things like, we're going to bind God. <laughs> right. and they actually say things like that. Like, we're going to bind the blood on this. Like, they can command God to do yeah. something. This is very <clears throat> foolish. See, what ought to be said of those that make requests of God? How, how should you posture your soul? You have to work this out yourself, but I say uh, you should have the utmost respect and honor for God. Now Judah he rehearsed to, to the ruler about their situation. He just rehearses what happened. You ask us if we had a, a brother and a father. We told you we did. We told you that the brother was uh, very close to his father and that if, if he lost his son, he'd go down to his grave. We told you all this. Uh, now, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you about this. If thou, if thou saidst unto thy servants, bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him, you told us to bring Benjamin? We did. We did tell you that, that if he leaves his father, his father will die. And you insisted and we brought him here. Now you, you seem to be asking us to go back home without him. And I, I'm telling you, uh, I, can't, I can't do this. You got to see, that Judah, this is quite a plea. He said, I'll stay with you. I'll stay with you. Let, let me be in his stead for you. I'll serve you rest of my life. Let, let, let him go. Let, let him go. <laughs> oh, if you can... Uh, if you can see it, when your case came up before God and you had come to Christ, Jesus said, let him go. Let him go, Father. Let him go. I'll serve you so that they'll be free with me. When I come to my Father and said, I, I don't want to I don't want to be his undoing because his life is bound up with the life of, of the boy. I want to look at that, that kind of attachment. His life is bound up. Uh, with, a, with the life of the, bo of the boy. Now this is illustrated in Jonathan and David. They had this same sort of uh, affiliation it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. See, that's the kind of affiliation now Jacob had with Benjamin that, that Judah is explaining. This capacity is within mankind in order the capacity to lay down your life for somebody else. is in, a, in man so that he can learn how to live for God. For a, a good man, some would dare to die, the scriptures say. See, life is actually meaningless if we don't please the Lord. It's actually, life is a waste. It's a waste of time for which men will account. Now, this kind of love where you're bound up this is commanded under the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God and love thy neighbor as thyself. See, there it is. One man's life bound together with another person's life. It's realized in the body of Christ we are knit together in love. See there? There it is, the same thing. Knit together we increase to the increase of God. See, that's... It's the same thing Joseph had with Benjamin, except it's realized to a higher degree in Christ Jesus. 
And he tells Joseph, he says, look, I became a surety. It's the first time in reference to this uh, event, the first time surety is used in the Bible in this sense. This role was chosen by Judah, who said to his father Jacob, who said to his father Jacob, what he here reports, I will be a surety for him. I'll take his place. Now, the greatest surety is Christ himself, who you've got to see as having taken our place. He is for us before God, not for himself. He for us is before God. He's a high priest for us before God. He makes intercession for us before God, see? He's ruling for us before God. He's, a, he's our surety. The surety means a guarantee. Jesus' presence before God for you is your guarantee that you'll get the blessing. He's a surety of, of the better covenant. Now let, me, let me refresh your mind what that covenant said because he's a surety that this will happen to you. I'll put my laws into their minds. All right, Jesus is your surety that that will happen to you. I will write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me a people. They shall all know me from the least to the greatest. I'll be merciful to their unrighteousnesses. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now you say, well, I want all of that. Jesus is the guarantee. Jesus in heaven at God's right hand as high priest and intercessor and mediator is your guarantee that what I just read will happen to you. Now you've got to believe that. See, that's why faith in Christ is imperative. Why it's imperative. Now this, uh, this is spelled out in, the, in Scripture about how believers live. None of us live to himself, no man dieth to himself, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. That's Romans 14. Our bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit. We are to glorify God with our body and in our spirit. See? It's in view of this surety. If Jesus is our surety, we're free to do this. Those who live should not live to themselves, but unto him that loved them and gave them rose again. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, that you should show forth the praises, that you should show forth the praises, that you should show forth the praises. That's, that's how a surety moves you to live. Now, the professed church has not done well in this area. Because of this, it's important among disciples. It, because of this, it is imported among disciples worldly wisdom. Because these, how we're to live isn't being done. So because it's not being done, there's not a high level of satisfaction among professing Christians. The, among professing Christians, there's not an overriding joy because they haven't done, they haven't presented themselves a living sacrifice to God. So to compensate for that, they have imported the wisdom of the world to try and produce this satisfaction, these, uh, these results. And in doing, they brought other gods in. They've taken uh, the world's manner of assessing things, making plans, reaching people, handling money. They've taken the world's wisdom on that and they've imported it into the church. They've taken the world's kind of music and they've just put some new words to it. Now let me state a conviction of mine. When you take a song of the world and you, you put Christian words to it, that's like saying to a golden calf, these be the gods that brought thee out of Egypt. I know that's not popular and I know some might disagree, so I won't dwell on it, but that's, that's how I view it. 
And uh, see, if ever today's Christian determine, they determine, and and preaching and teaching and exhortation has to urge this to happen. If they determine to love and serve God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, if they determine to do that, it will so revolutionize the church that it will not be recognized. Amen. It'll be confu it'll confuse the world. <laughs> be so different. Then he has a how shall I go up without the lad? I saw how my father reacted when he thought Joseph had died. He wept. Remember, sons and daughters came to comfort him, and he refused to be comforted. I saw that. I don't want to see it again. I've read about how Jesus wept over the sin of Jerusalem. I don't want him to weep again. I saw, I'd read, I've read, been con convicted of how he was disappointed with some of his disciples and said, how long shall I be with you? Are you still yet unbelieving? I don't want him to say that to me. Amen. I don't want to be the source of that. So you see in this record here, we've had sort of a commentary on sensitivity and tenderness and conviction and how God brings people along. I think we're living in a day when this is uh, very timely. These are things you want to really work on being, this is not the time for a lot of theological haranguing and this sort of thing. It's a time for people to lay down their lives, lay them down. Because if you're, if you're not willing to sacrifice for Christ, are you fool, so foolish as to think his sacrifice will count for you? Yeah. I know you're not, but I just I felt that needed to be said. <laughs> Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? I believe that's all that I'll have to say. A statement that those those um, ancient believers back there, Abraham and Isaac, they had a more pure sense of yeah. the knowledge of God than what you see in the time we live in. And it's almost as though more information has given the flesh something to pretend. It is say, well, we we ought to be like this. We know, so we'll pretend we're like that, and like that's ever going to produce what a what a faith produces, but it won't. But see, I can see where the information in the wrong hands can, can give someone confidence where there should be no confidence. Yeah. Unless you're walking by faith, you're not pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you're doing a certain thing, it's, it's whether or not you're believing. If you're believing, you will produce the, the works. Yes. But if you, you can't produce the faith any other way, I mean, it, it can't be done. Yeah. And when you read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, now Joseph, they never departed. All they went through, they never departed. And once they got into Canaan, they never left it again. Jo Jacob left it to go be with Joseph, but they, he went back there to be buried. <laughs> Joseph did too. But that's why they didn't. God never had to retrieve any of those men, which is something to think upon. <laughs> Anyone else tonight? Yes, Brother Tony? That was a, a delightful illustration of, well, look in our sacks. Yes. See what's in our sacks. Yes. That's right. Uh, be, be, be knowledgeable about what's been been, been placed in our sacks. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yes, Sister Ada? Um, reminder of how the Lord can take a situation that uh, where you may be accused of a sin that you haven't committed mm -hmm. in order to convict you of a sin that you did commit. Very yeah. good, very mm -hmm. good. And that it's good for the believer to yeah. be sensitive to the Lord mm -hmm. and not simply to focus on when you've been when you've been wronged, mm -hmm. but to be contrite enough to allow yourself to repent of those things Amen. that you have done. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Others tonight? Mm. Amen. Yeah. All right. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this this record and for the revelation it gives of your of the way and manner in which you work. We see a lot of these parallels in our own lives. We give you thanks for their, these, this record that has helped us to interpret ourselves as well as to be more fully acquainted with your own manners. We ask that this kind of insight might continue to increase. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.